and hey, can I get a thumbs up in the back? It'll open the whole room. Okay. All right. Uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is uh, mostly about just sort of setting up the conversation um, that we're going to have later. Um, and I am going to talk about one tool that we use a lot um, in house that I think relates to where we see um, civic engagement, uh, particularly tech oriented civic engagement, heading um, these days. Um, so, just quickly about Place Matters, we're a, a nonprofit, we're 501c3 uh, out of Denver, Colorado. Um, we work on a variety of grants um, from groups like the Core Foundation um, and then also fee for service projects as well. And so, our model is really to do research to understand um, sort of what the needs are and then to actually do projects on the ground to see how they work. And that cycle is really how we come up with what we think um, makes sense and what we sort of put our energy towards then when it comes to tool development and technology. Um, and we're particularly good, as Della said, at decision support tools, so scenario planning, GIS analysis, um, information design, and data visualization, um, and then how you bring those to the table for a civic engagement. Most of our work also tends to have a heavy component on capacity building and training, so we tend to do work where when we leave, working with the community, um, they can do a lot of these things on their own. Um, so we kind of have a put ourselves out of business sort of approach to this sort of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk just very briefly about um, two things that I think are really interesting in the work that's going on these days. Uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about civic engagement. So when we sort of start a civic engagement process with people, we typically do the process design as we sort of establish questions, you know, we ask people to answer questions like, what financial resources are available for the type of engagement that needs to be done? What are the decisions to be made? And this really comes out of the work that IEP2, which is the International Association for Public Participation, um, they tend to refer to a spectrum of engagement that if you're a planner, you probably have seen this graphic at some point in your planning career of sort of inform on one end and sort of all the way down to empower on the other end. And it corresponds, um, in its sort of most basic sense, it corresponds to the level of input that people are giving, but it also corresponds to the type of information that people need and the type of engagement exercises that make the most sense. And so we tend to first start by asking, what are, the, what are the actual decisions to be made? Are you just wanting to have a conversation about issues and have a sort of learning experience? Are there actual hard decisions to be made about budgeting or other sort of very sort of clear planning issues? And then once you've understood what the decisions are, we tend to ask people sort of what input will help inform that decision. Do you need people to vision about what kind of future they want? Or have you already done that? You have a vision and you really need to focus more on um, what are the trade-offs and understanding um, what the sort of spatial outcomes would be of different policies. And then finally, how much can the public actually inform the decision? Planners, we tend to think in terms of sort of God scenarios, much, well, we could do this and then we could do that, but in reality, a lot of what happens in planning is outside of our control, and we're often in a position in which we're responding to what other forces are gonna be making decisions about, and we need to craft our public engagement scenarios with that in mind. Only once you've answered those sorts of questions can you really get down to choosing the right tools. And then the questions that you might ask there would be, what's the right level of engagement? So again, referring to that inform on the one hand to empower. What's the cost benefit of analysis? There's some workshops type events that are very popular in planning, traditionally the big public forum. And those can be incredibly expensive when you look at it from a per person engaged level to put on. The planning, the lead time, all the resources that goes into putting those on can be really expensive compared to survey-based methods or small group methods where you go to them sort of strategies. For instance, having meetings after a church service or during um, a club meeting. But there are trade-offs, right? The public forums, the big three-hour workshops can be incredibly useful um, for getting a, a depth of feedback and conversations that you may not be able to get through the shorter term ones. So you have to sort of weigh those trade-offs. Um, the time frame is another key piece that, particularly on the tools front, can be um, can be tricky. A lot of tools are particularly helpful for short spurts of engagement, for campaigns, but in the long term can become cost or labor prohibitive, and so it can become difficult to maintain those tools over time. Other tools, the C-click fixes of the world, are designed more for sort of long-term maintenance to build an online hub that people will go to, perhaps not even tied to a specific project, but just for ongoing um, conversation about what you want to see in the community. And then finally, as we all know, different tools um, match up better to different audiences and the types of engagement and the types of technology that they're comfortable with. 
Uh, something that I think I always like to talk about at these sorts of things is just how quickly the technology field is changing. So Pew, um, the Pew uh, Center for Internet um, Research has uh, really great data on who's using technology, how they're using it, and disaggregating that data by all sorts of demographic characteristics that planners get really excited to hear about. Um, in particular, this is um, the change in smartphone ownership from 2011 to 2013, so just two years. Um, and you can see the jumps, so the numbers at the top are the, um, the percent changes, and the bundles, the sort of groupings of bars there are um, different income levels. So you can see that even in the lowest income level, we've seen 14%, 23%. Um, gains in smartphone ownership in two years. And so I think we have to check the sort of conventional wisdom about who has access to technology and not only the access, but how they're using it. For some, for some groups, smartphones are becoming their primary access to the internet. Um, and so that changes the way that we use tools and the way we use design so we can gauge some processes. So that brings us to the other piece of the work that we do a lot of, which is figuring out how do you take all the technical information that we as planners um, sort of live with every single day. How do you make that not only understandable, but compelling um, and part of the actual decision-making process? How do you make it central um, in conversations about um, planning issues? Um, it's easy to understand why people feel overwhelmed. We have an increasing amount of information in front of us, um, and it's easy to feel a little disoriented by it. Um, for planners, I think there are two particular um, use cases in which data and information can be tricky. One is weighing trade-offs, uh, helping people understand um, that planning can be a bit like a game of whack-a-mole. You, know, you, you deal with this issue, but this other issue is going to pop up, and there's a push-pull relationship between um, the issues that we're often asking people to wrestle with and to give us feedback on. And so how do you visualize, how do you communicate the trade-offs in those issues? And then the second piece is how do you connect those values that you get out of a visioning session um, to actual policy? So people say they have the sort of mom and apple pie things that they want, right? They want to have multiple communities or they want to feel safe. That's a, a classic sort of conundrum. They want to feel safe. But what does it actually look like in spatial policy? And how do you help people understand how the sort of wonky world that we live in connects to the values um, that they say are really important to them? And so a couple of quick emerging strategies, and I'm going to do one sort of quick fly-through demo of, of a tool that we've been using to address some of these things. Um, the first strategy is to be visual, and really to be more visual. Planners, we can be a very tech text-heavy profession, and I think um, there's some really great research coming out now. Um, it's been coming out for a while, and it's finally starting to sort of make it from the research world into the practitioner world about just how visual we are <coughs> and about how, how much um, information design that uses visual strategies as well as text-based strategies can really help to break down a lot of the complexity um, and the technical sort of tedious aspects of the work that we're doing. The second sort of strategy is to design for layered learning. Um, so if you think about a map, as you zoom into a map, you'll see more road detail, you'll see more landmarks, you'll see the building footprints. And we can similarly start to design the learning process for that, and I'll show you an example of that in the tool that I'm going to show. Um, but flat pages of all the text um, on a topic um, can be incredibly overwhelming and can turn people off. If you can instead have um, sort of the executive summary strategy and apply that in a kind of radical way to the information you put in front of people, you'll find that you can sort of create breadcrumbs that lead them into deeper knowledge about topics. And then finally, uh, on a related topic, is to mix exploration with guidance. So a lot we've been working with um, the Denver Regional Council of Governments on an equity atlas that they've released. And it's a really great resource that collects a lot of data and puts it up online in an open source framework for exploring how the data that we've been collecting in the Denver region impacts equity issues. The challenge is, you go to it and it's just a map with just layers and layers and layers, and it's hard to know where to start, even if you're a planning professional, much less if you don't have a background turning layers on and off and, and understanding the relationship between housing location and transportation access and equity issues. And so there are ways that we can mix the exploratory process that we can put for people with data with guidance, with help bubbles, with pop-ups that help guide people through the process, that tell people what the story is behind the data that they're looking at, and then let go and give them control to start playing with dials and learning um, in an exploratory way. 